Over time, humans have evolved to thrive on Earth. Everything from how we breathe to how we move is built for the conditions on land. So what happens when we travel outside of Earth's atmosphere and spend time in space? Well, there's an entire branch of medicine dedicated to answering this question as humans push the boundaries of space exploration. One of the careers within this field is a NASA flight surgeon, a specially trained doctor that works from the NASA Mission Control Center to check on the crew of astronauts in space. This person is always at the ready in case a situation develops where they need to give quick medical advice or direction. In addition to this position, each mission has one astronaut on the spacecraft who is assigned the title of crew medical officer. But this person doesn't need to be a physician. It's just some additional training that any of the astronauts get when they're here on, on Earth. So they get training on how to start an IV line and how to use some of the medical equipment that exists on the space station. And again, the thing is that you have a platoon of flight surgeons and medical experts at your disposal if anything needs to be done or if there's any medical cases. That's Dr. Emmanuel Urquita, the chief medical officer at the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, a key partner of NASA. He's also an assistant professor at the Center for Space Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. He says the field of space medicine is always evolving as people prepare for future endeavors, like sending humans to Mars, a mission that poses many challenges. As we move on missions farther and longer from Earth and longer than what we have on the space station, a mission to Mars is going to take about three years, right? And they're going to be fully isolated most of the time there. So once you are on Mars or on a Mars orbit, the delay of communications is going to be about 40 minutes. So if you have a medical emergency and you have to call Houston, it's going to take about 20 minutes for those communications to come back to Earth. And then when the flight surgeon gets the message, another 20 minutes to respond back, back to Mars. So you cannot rely on real-time support and real-time communications for that. If there's a medical emergency in 40 minutes, you know, a lot of things can happen in 40 minutes. During this mission to Mars, scientists have mapped out that there will be about a one-month period where the sun will be in between Mars and Earth, blocking out all forms of communication. In the case of a medical emergency, the astronauts would have to figure it out alone. Another barrier, keeping a fresh supply of medications. The other thing is how will we make sure that they have enough medications for this trip? Most of the medications expire in a year or so. So how would we be able to produce medications in real time so that we have all of the medical capabilities when you cannot have any resupply vehicles? The three-year mission to Mars would break the record for the longest time spent in space. Currently, the title goes to a Russian astronaut who was in orbit for more than 14 months from 1994 to 1995. Urquita says that on average, today, the majority of flights are six months or shorter. But in any case, this confined, isolating, and unnatural environment can take a heavy toll on the body. We, as a human species, we have been designed and we have evolved over millions of years on a one-gravity environment with a normal atmospheric pressure, with a very specific concentration of oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere, really with the gravity pulling the blood to our legs and telling our brain and our ears and our eyes where is up, down, left, right, front, and back. So when the astronauts go to space, the first thing that happens is that you immediately remove the gravitational field from them. So really, immediately, there's a fluid shifting. So the blood that normally humans, we have about 80% of the blood on the legs because, again, there's the pull from the gravity to the legs. So when you go to space, there's no gravity. So all this blood needs to be distributed to the rest of the body. So there's an equal amount of pressure on the legs, the, the abdomen, the chest, and the head. Despite the many months or years of training on Earth, this sudden shift into a zero-gravity setting can be jarring for the body. One of the most common ailments that astronauts battle with is muscle and bone atrophy. Rikita says that each month spent in space sums up to about a 10% drop in muscle mass. This naturally occurs because the body is no longer working against the force of gravity, and without this constant effort, these parts deteriorate. To counteract this, the crew spends hours every day exercising. As a matter of fact, we have been on the space station for the last 20 plus years. And um, we have very, very robust equipment there. There's three exercise devices. One is a weightlifting device. We have a treadmill, 
and we have a cycle ergometer, which is basically a bicycle. So the astronauts have to do around two hours of exercise every single day so they keep the loss of muscle and bone as minimal as possible. So when they come back to Earth, really, there's not a lot of muscle and bone that is lost. Now, that being said, when we go deeper into space, the, the volume that the spacecraft will have available to accommodate this equipment is very small. So we'll not have those really uh, sturdy equipment that we have on, on the space station available. So we will need to think and we need to develop new technologies that can provide the same level of countermeasures and prevention while making the, the equipment as smaller as possible. In addition to muscle and bone loss, another side effect can be vision impairment. This condition is commonly referred to as space flight associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS. Some astronauts that have been in space for long duration flights have reported becoming far sighted as early as three weeks into the mission. This means they can no longer read close up text as easily as they could before. Scientists haven't yet determined the exact cause of this condition, but there are several hypotheses. What we see in the eye is that. If you do an MRI, a magnetic resonance imaging of the eyeball before flight, you will see that the eyeball is a perfect uh, sphere, it's a perfect circle. Now, if you take the same MRI of the same astronaut after flight, someone who has developed the symptoms of SANS that I was mentioning, then you can see that really the shape of the eye changes a little bit. The part of the eye that is close to the brain, where the optic nerve comes from the brain into the eyeball, you can see that, that part is a little bit pushed forward. So it's not as spheric as it was before. So those changes are mainly driven by an increase of fluid, and this comes from the cephalate fluid, or the fluid shift that I was mentioning at the beginning of this talk. Because there's no gravity pulling fluid down toward the legs, there's an increase in pressure in the head and eyes, which Orkita and other scientists believe creates this space-specific syndrome. However, there are still some mysterious aspects of SANS that scientists can't seem to explain. There's a lot of interesting things of, on SANS. Like, if you're going to get SANS, it always starts on the right eye. And then it will, all, then if it becomes bilateral, it will move to the left eye. But it always starts on the right side. In terms of treatment for this syndrome, there's no quick or easy fix. For now, the best option is to send astronauts reading glasses to improve their eyesight. The good news is that once astronauts are back on Earth, their vision has shown to slowly return to normal. This healing can take weeks or months for most, but there have been reported cases where it's taken years for the eyes to fully readjust. While SANS often fades with time, one other risk does not. This is cosmic radiation, a form of energy that is ubiquitous in space and can lead to radiation sickness and an increased lifetime risk of developing cancer and other diseases. So how does space radiation differ from what we're used to on Earth? Here on Earth, we're worried about radiation from, let's say, X-rays, nuclear power plants, the remnants from all the nuclear testing that is still in the atmosphere, and mostly radiation from underground, the radon that comes from underground. And this is radiation that you can shield with thick materials like concrete or lead. And this is radiation that is not very energetic. It doesn't have a lot of energy. It doesn't travel that fast. Now, when you talk about radiation in space, there's two types of radiation that you have to worry about. The first one is the galactic cosmic radiation that comes from supernova from stars. Every time a star explodes, there's radiation they release. And there's also radiation that is remnant from the Big Bang, from the creation of the universe. So this radiation that we call galactic cosmic radiation, or GCR, is very, very difficult to shield. The second type of radiation is the solar particle events. This is when there's a solar flare on the sun, and most of these are somehow predictable. So when something like this happens, the astronauts will have to go to the most shielded part of the, of the spacecraft and could be protected from radiation. Rikita notes that galactic space radiation poses a big risk to astronauts and is one of the most challenging problems to solve. One way scientists are searching for answers is by studying organisms that are far more resistant to radiation than we are. One extremely small animal that scientists are particularly interested in is the tardigrade, a microscopic water-dwelling creature that is one of the oldest species known to man. These are very, very tiny species that are extremely resilient to extreme environments, like extremes of temperatures, extremes of pressures, and also very, very increased levels of radiation. So we're looking into what genes these tardigrades or these water birds have that share the genes with humans, and we call those human homologs. 
We're also looking at other species, for example, E. coli. It's a type of bacteria that also has some genes that increase their natural resistance to radiation. The eventual end goal is that once these shared genes are found, scientists can one day increase the expression of these genes in humans in order to increase our natural resiliency to radiation. It's very complex work, but provides an avenue of hope for the future. As humans continue to push the envelope on space travel, there come many challenges and risks. But the scientists, engineers, and astronauts who dream big are ready to tackle these head on. To find out more about this topic and our guest, Dr. Emmanuel Urquita, visit viewpointsradio.org. This segment was written and produced by Amira Zaveri. I'm Gary Price. Saving for taxes is hard for many business owners, perhaps especially independent contractors, artists, and entrepreneurs. Some business owners simply can't stop themselves from spending all the money as it comes in, then incurring more and more unsecured debt to pay their taxes and other obligations. Those businesses are sinking, even if they don't know it yet. But help for debtors is available now. Business Debtors Anonymous is a 12-step recovery program with meetings every day where members support one another as they stop incurring new unsecured debt. At meetings, recovering members share how their lives have been transformed. Their stories will be reassuringly similar to your own. This 12-step program offers hope, clarity, and serenity, along with immediately usable tools to support better management of your personal and business finances. Find more information and request free program literature at helpfordebtors.org. That's helpfordebtors.org. A new report from Mimecast shows that 79% of companies experienced a business disruption or financial loss last year due to a lack of cyber preparedness. The annual State of Email Security report by cyber resilience company Mimecast shows that a stunning 61% of companies were hit by ransomware last year, on average losing six working days. Even though 70% of organizations surveyed expect to be harmed by an email-borne attack this year, 40% still fall short in one or more critical areas of email security systems. According to Josh Douglas, Mimecast Vice President of Threat Intelligence. Companies know they're exposed, but are not committing to the technology and training required to protect their environment. These exposure points are inflamed by so many companies rapidly adopting digital office models, leaving employees untrained and unprotected in this highly distributed digital environment puts organizations at risk of digital deception. Download the full report and learn how companies can protect themselves at Mimecast.com. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of MediaTracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Coming up on Viewpoints. There were 25 of their planes that went up that day, 13 got shot down, 12 came back. And the survivors that came back told horrifying stories of how many hundreds of German fighters swarming around them. The on and off screen life of the late actor, Jimmy Stewart. Then... Most of my diet is vegetables, tofu to some degree. But I do eat some fish, and one of the reasons I eat fish is because fish is actually a pretty good carbon deal. Crafting a diet for a better climate. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints.